Um, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you for the invitation to be here. Thank you all for still being here and not leaving when you saw that there was a philosopher on the menu. Um, when I was finishing my undergraduate degree, I really wanted to go into finance because I had the perception that it was how the world really works. It's how the world has really changed, that the financiers are the people with real influence. And I wanted to have an influence. So I got together with a, a family friend who is a rather well-known financier. I won't name him because I'm sure many of you know him. And I talked to him about his life in finance um, and how he felt about it. Long pause when I asked him how he felt about it. And he said, eventually he said, well, finance is all very well as long as you know what it's all for. And I've spent the last 20 years trying to answer that question, not just about finance, but about everything. I work with many, many different groups of people, trying to help them to notice that this question, what is it all for, is implicit in everything that they do. And unless they occasionally step back and ask what it's all for, they get lost. You probably think that none of you have been doing either philosophy or ethics today, but I promise you, you've been doing it all afternoon. Every time we ask about the difference between where we are and where we should be, we're doing it. We're implicitly asking and answering the question, what is it all for? So, in the final moments we have together today, I'd like to just step back and do that orientation. I'll begin by trying to characterize our situation as I see it. And I don't mean the situation of you in this room. You're the leaders, you're the converts. I mean our situation as a human family. Some of you might have heard of Simon Sharp, who's just written this fantastic book. I really recommend it. Simon Sharp points out, we need to be decarbonizing five times faster than we currently are. Five times faster. He puts it like this, winning slowly is the same as losing. That means we're losing right now. Let me characterize our situation. I think a lot of people feel like this. A crowd is walking together. That's everybody, human beings. At some point, one of them notices that there's a cliff ahead. And some take a while to be convinced that the cliff is really there, but then slowly news that about the existence of this cliff spreads among the group. They start talking about how they probably ought to change direction, but they don't seem to be able to. As the cliff gets closer, some of them start to panic and they start to say, we really need to change direction. And they still can't seem to be able to, but they don't really understand why. At some point, they realize they're so close to the cliff, it's too late. They really want to live. Some of them love each other very much. But eventually, they just realize, no matter how much they can see the cliff, they seem not to be able to turn around. And so they start saying goodbye to each other. I think a lot of people feel like that right now. Next year, we're forecast to hit 1.5 degrees of warming for the first time. That's 28 years after the start of the COP process. A couple of years ago, <coughs> I was at a summit at the Vatican before COP26 with the world's most senior faith leaders. We had met to try to leverage the 86% of the world who belong to a faith community in the fight against climate change. And we were privileged to hear the then chair of the IPCC, Dr. Ho Sung Lee, uh, address us. And he gave us the usual list of the apocalyptic scenarios that we were facing, and then he said, but the question that keeps them up at night is not what is happening. We know the answer to that. It is not what should we do about it? We know the answer to that too. The question that keeps them up at night, he said, is why do we not do what we know we should do? I don't want to give you the apocalyptic scenarios. Every year we're smashing heat records. We know that the predictions of climate change were too conservative. We know that the impacts will be worse than we thought. But we knew all this before it happened. We could have guessed that the IPCC projections were too conservative because this is science by committee and it's one of the largest committees in the world and committees work by compromise. 
And yes, we know that not of all our emissions have been registered, but we could have guessed that too. And in any case, we should have applied the precautionary principle that you assume the best, that you assume the worst rather than the best, and you planned for the worst rather than the best, as anybody does who's involved in risk management. But we didn't do that. I think it's worth pausing to think about this, not to be miserable and focus on the past, because the amazing thing about today is it's been so forward-looking, but because there's something to learn from this. There's loads of things to learn from this, but there are two in particular that I want to briefly mention. I don't think that the real limits to our action have been technical or scientific ones. Human beings have an extraordinary capacity to innovate when we want to. We could have innovated quicker and better. I don't believe those are the real limits to action. If it's knowledge we have lacked, it's not knowledge about the universe or about technology or even about finance, it's knowledge about ourselves. The first limit I've already mentioned, a failure to think about what this is all for and to embed in our systems those goals. Let me give you an example. A friend of mine has been a committed smoker all her life from a very young age. Friends and family begged her to stop. She had all the lessons in school. I was sitting next to her. She had all the pictures on the packets. There was no information about what smoking would do to her that she didn't have. And then one day, about a year ago, she suddenly stopped. And we were all totally amazed and couldn't figure out what was going on. Then, of course, we figured it out. She was pregnant. The information about smoking wasn't enough to change her behavior. Love for her unborn child was enough to change her behavior. Human beings are not computers. We're animals. It is neurologically impossible to act on a fact alone. Human beings don't act on facts. They act on values, that is to say, a sense of not, not of what is true, but of what is important. In order to act on a fact, it has to connect with something I care about. The spring of human motivation is not statistics. It's some object of care. It's some object of purpose. The environmental movement, and I hold myself totally guilty of this, has been largely a, a kind of litany of the recitation of terrifying facts. But if those facts are, aren't inserted into narratives about why we would care about those facts, or to put it differently, what it's all for anyway, there's no action. In business and finance, to make this concrete, people talk so much about sustainability, but so little about what it is that we should want to sustain. We talk so much about targets, but so little about purposes. We talk so much about growth, but so little about what growth is for, what growth is towards, growth in what? How utterly ironic it would be if our attachment to growth destroyed us because we never stop to think about what growth is for. That's the most extreme case of the tail wagging the dog. Our approach to business and finance as, of course, everything else, but here we are in this room. Our approach to business and finance needs to be not, not money-driven, but value-driven. Not financial value, not monetary value, human value. The human is what it's all about, not the money. The money is just a means to the flourishing of the human. That's what growth is for, right? A really human future an actually livable human future. When the growth gets in the way of that future, the tail is wagging the dog. The thing we stand to lose if we go on letting growth trump emissions cuts, and I know I don't need to say this to you, but you're going to go out and say this to everybody else. The thing that we stand to lose is actually humanity itself. It's not nature. Nature's gonna be fine. 
Nature's been through five rounds of great extinctions already, and it's definitely going to survive this one. The thing that, that is at risk is humanity. That's what our current model of growth, our current system, will take away. But this sense of purpose, this sense of direction, this sense of, if I can call it this, mission, somewhere that we need to go, somewhere that we need to get to, that's only part of the story. The other part of the story is where things get uncomfortable. And we were told at the beginning of the day that we should be uncomfortable. So let's all be uncomfortable together, but particularly, um, I'm sorry to say, all of you, because I think I'm the only philosopher in the room. The other part is not about purpose, it's about power. Responsibilities for causing and for solving this crisis are not only heavily differentiated. They're so disproportionately unequal that to think of them as widely shared is a travesty. To show the real situation, the story that I told you at the beginning about the crowd going towards the cliff should actually depict some people carrying other people towards the edge. Or, and here the limits of the image become apparent, it should actually depict just a few people carrying almost everyone else. Let me just try and explain what I mean. I don't mean only that the developed world has produced vastly more atmospheric carbon than the developing world, although that is, of course, both true and deeply relevant. I mean, more troublingly, that some of us have a great deal more ability to do something about that than everyone else. I have more power than a woman in Eritrea. The CEO of BP has more power than me. The poor woman in Eritrea is not walking towards the edge of the cliff. She's being carried there. And she can do nothing about it. My story with the cliff makes it look as though humanity is committing a kind of collective suicide, and that's how it's often been described. But I've come to think that that's a totally inappropriate image. It's less suicide and more murder. Most people on the planet are victims, not perpetrators. Not just because they will suffer more, because they're less protected, but because their agency, such as it is, operates within a system that they have very little influence over. As we all know, and that's why we're all here, climate change is a systemic problem. Individuals only operate within systems. They don't operate ever apart from them. And the system as it currently functions actively rewards those whose activities destroy the future. This is a system in which carbon emissions are still, despite everything, profitable. Preaching ecological conversion at the individual level makes it seem as though most people need to take responsibility for the situation. But that narrative, of course, plays into the hands of those who have set up the system to their own benefit. I don't necessarily mean deliberately, but in fact. And this is a system in which only certain kinds of choices are available to the vast majority of individuals. As I'm sure you will know, it was BP who popularized the idea of the carbon footprint, which encourages individual consumers to see reducing carbon as their own personal responsibility. But this is extremely unfair. It's also untrue. When people show up at the pump, there's nothing in it except petrol. I don't mean it's that simple, but that's just an image. Most people live in a social and economic architecture that totally constrains their choices and they don't have agency, direct agency, at the level of architecture. They can't realistically, in other words, make a choice to live a less carbon-intensive life. The irony is that most individuals are forced to sponsor a system which is destroying their future, and they can't opt out of that. If we want to change the choices that people make, it just is not fair and not realistic to demand point blank that they make choices that are de facto impossible for them. We need to change the system, 
so that the right choices become not just accessible, but easy. Of course, I'm not saying all this to dehumanize the woman in Eritrea and these so-called ordinary people. On the contrary, it's an attempt to humanize those people, which is most people on the planet, to suggest that it's morally offensive to ask them to take responsibility for the situation. It is those who have power at the level of the system who are answerable and accountable because they are actually able to make the change. It is they who have ability to make the change. In this room, to conclude, excuse me for being very direct, in this room is the knowledge and yes, the power in the literal sense of the ability to influence the system at the level of system. It is you who need to think not just about how to make growth happen, but what the growth is for, what it is that you're trying to grow. It's you who need to think not just about sustainability, but about what it is that we should want to sustain. It's you who need to think not just about targets, but about purposes. I know, of course, that you too are constrained. I know that the system is bigger than any of you, and it has its own terrifying momentum. And a lot of the conversations that I've heard today have reflected that. But the, the reality is you have more power than others to influence the system at the level of system, the system in which others have to operate. Because when we're talking about the global financial system, that is everybody, everybody on the planet. So I'm, I'm sorry to say the pressure is on you <laughs> to break from the status quo. Climate solutions exist. We know they do. Innovation is really possible. People are doing it. But it has to be now, and it has to be system level. You're the people who can change the system so that the tail, which is growth and profit, doesn't wag the dog which is humanity itself. I am sure that this task is not easy. But it was people like you who designed the system in the first place. You can fix it. Thank you. <laughs>